conversation. Uh, Amazon just bought Whole Foods. Um, um, and at a premium, which is like Disney buying Marvel, okay, they have overpaid for what it's worth to anybody but them. And they, for them, it's a bargain at the price no one else would pay because all they got to do is hook it to Amazon Prime points and they immediately um, increase the value of the company by 25%. So they just bought Whole Foods. Um, make no mistake, Bezos has changed his mind about brick and mortar. And now these moves, we want to be in the convenience store business, we want to be in the bookstore business. I personally think they're either going to kill or buy Barnes & Noble within three years. Um, um, uh, they, they have embraced the idea, two ideas. One, that there's a lot of people who want to go to a brick and mortar place and they aren't going to die as quickly as we originally hoped they would. <laughs> All right. Um, secondly, the synergy gives them enormous advantage, and when they hook two together, they add value to both. That's what, and that's a very different position than where he was six, seven years ago. Okay. But it is definitely where he is now. Okay. And they have the ability so take a business like a convenience store, which they are screwing with right now, the 7-Eleven business, the Speedway business. Those businesses are called convenience stores because they are, they are, their business is 99.9% .9 driven by convenience, meaning no brand preference, really. If you stop to get coffee and a donut on your way to work, you almost certainly stop at the one that's on the left side of the street not the right side of the street, so you don't have to navigate four lanes of rush hour traffic to get back in the direction in which you're going. If you're coming home, you stop at the one on the right side of the street. It's truly the convenience business. Amazon has the ability to change it and make it a destination business. They have the ability to make you choose to turn left to go across four lanes of traffic to go to the Amazon convenience store, driving past a 7-Eleven and a Speedway to get there because they have the ability to hook it to Amazon Prime and Amazon Prime membership, and they get it. So you will see probably this the first of a series of, train, of, of acquisitions. And that's the other thing he's changed his mind about, which is significant. If you go back six, seven years, Amazon was all about build it, not buy it. Now they are 50-50. They're thinking, why build it when we can buy it? And we basically can buy it for free. So why take the time to build it? So it's interesting to watch. I'm going to pick up on page 55 in your manuals, principle 14. Stop selling stuff. The way to know if you're doing it and the way to know if you're paying a bad copywriter who is doing it, the way to eavesdrop on a salesperson's presentation and know if he's doing it is if he's using this list. If you or he or they are writing or talking predominantly about the product, its features and benefits, the, the, uh, the competitive superiority, ours is made out of platinum and theirs is made out of plastic, um, and price, then you are a poor advertiser, marketer, or salesperson. This is the unsophisticated, traditional, hasn't changed, approach to advertising, marketing, and selling. The sophisticated approach to advertising, marketing, and selling is the psychological approach 
to advertising, marketing, and selling. Not what is this, not what is it made out of, not what does it do, not what does it do better or more reliably than the blue one, how cheap is it, but what does it mean? That's the sophisticated psychological approach to selling. What does it mean? So I, I sold it last year, but I had for several years um, um, has one of my cars. I had a, um, some of you saw it, a 1972 AMC Javelin AMX, um, which when they were new, they were terrible automobiles. Um, old with 300,000 miles on them, they're really terrible automobiles. Uh, uh, um, I mean, the poor thing, it looks great, it looks great, but the poor thing just, you know, just can't function. Um, um, and uh, as a, first, the, a 1973, which is what I really wanted, but one wasn't available. Um, uh, the 1973 Javelin is the first new car I bought with my own money. Um, and uh, so I went to get something as close to what I had owned in 1973 um, as I could get. And in 1973, the new one rolled out of the showroom, cost me $3,990. Um, which, of course, I had to finance every bit of it and get a co-signer and yada, yada. The one I bought three years ago um, with at least 300,000 miles on it because, of course, cars of that era, as long as you were willing to drive without a speedometer, you could disconnect the cable and not put miles on them at all. So the thing had an admitted 300,000 miles. <laughs> God knows what it really had on it, um, I paid exactly a 10 times multiple. I paid $39,950 for this thing. Covered in the, the bottom was mostly made of rust. Um, uh, it had every problem a car can have, and uh, I paid 40 grand for it. Why? Well, not for the car, not for transportation, not for its comparatives, its features and benefits. It had none. It had power windows, which in 1973 was kind of a big deal. But, and it had a Pierre Cardin whiz-bang interior. But I mean, really, it wasn't about the features and the benefits. It certainly wasn't about the functionality, because right? you need a $100,000 a year mechanic with the 39,000, just like you know the price you pay for the racehorse at the auction is the least amount of money you will probably ever spend on that horse. Um, from there on, the bills mount. Um, and the same with these cars, right? So why buy it? Only because of psychological, arguably psychologically indefensible reasons, right? About what it means. So when you sell for all of the reasons most people sell things for, what it is, what it does, why it's better somehow than something else that does the same thing, and on its price, when you sell based on that, you are putting yourself in a similar position to where you put yourself when you use search. You are putting yourself in a commoditizable price suppressive competitive environment. If we sell a car based on what is the car, who made it, does it have video screens on the back seats to amuse the children, uh, has it won a safety award and its other thing didn't win a safety award, does it stop three feet quicker than everything else in its category, and on price, we are up against every other stinking car there is. At least everyone in its price cat 
to guard. The minute we are selling something based on its meaning to its buyer, a lot of those things now don't matter because it stopped three feet. Now, the Jeep out there, so the Jeep weighs 62 tons. Um, it has four-wheel drive, but it does not have what all your SUVs have called skid control. They didn't make that in 1986. So when you come down a hill with any kind of snow or ice on it, you don't stop. Forget three feet, four feet, two feet. You just slide on because you have six tons heading down an icy hill. Good luck. It stays perfectly straight, by the way. You don't need skid control, but it stays straight right through the stop sign and halfway up the hill on the other side. That's what it does. And I don't care because I bought it not for that reason. So the minute you are selling things to people based on what they mean to those people, all normal competitive issues and all normal restrictions and all normal concerns start to go away. They become less and less and less relevant. So if you want to sell in an environment, again, where you have very little competition, where price doesn't matter, where you don't need functionality superiority, you can sell with functionality inferiority. You can literally sell arguably the least functional thing for the highest price with no competition. It's all about what does this mean to this buyer, not any of this other stuff. Now, most marketers understand this conceptually. Now, if all they did is go to school and get a PhD in marketing, they don't. I've seen the recent textbooks, and they're all still teaching this crap. Product, compare, that's what they're teaching. Okay? So if you get a P, if, you, if, if the little guy there goes and gets a PhD in marketing, he's going to be a master of that list. Product, event, that's what he's going to be a master of. Okay? They're not going to teach him this shit. But every pro kind of gets it. Okay? Anybody that's written copy successfully for any length of time, just as Carlton described last night, he gets it because he got a degree in psychology, okay. um, understands conceptually everything I just said. And they would all sit and nod. But then they will go back and they will default to the, to, to the bottom list. And they'll default to it for all sorts of reasons, laziness, forgetfulness, habit, peer pressure. You can't win an ad award doing the other stuff. The client in the way, on and on and on and on and on. It's hard to stay unanchored, untethered to product, price, comparative service. It's really hard. But that's where the big wins are. Not what that thing is. What is it going to mean to somebody? So in every product category, clocks are as good as any. Go to Walmart or Target, and you can buy a clock, an analog clock, or a digital for that matter, a basic plain clock that tells time. Cheap. Pretty cheap, you can buy one that announces the time. If you want to hear it audibly, you can find it at Walmart. Now your price starts to climb when you go to Hobby Lobby and, oh, you like an antique one that looks like it was a captain's clock because your grandfather was in the Navy. The more of those elements I start to introduce, the more all the other clocks don't matter, price doesn't matter, and even does the son of a bitch keep time doesn't start to matter. 
So if you come to my office area in my home, I have a Disney clock. And it goes off every hour. And the low characters, Goofy swings on a pendulum. And Donald and Mickey announce the time. Oh, it's 8 o'clock. Time for a break. Oh, it's 9 o'clock. What a wonderful day we're having today. OK, they do that, OK? However, it's only right about one third of the time. Right? I don't know if that was intentional or not, but the damn thing doesn't keep time, right? which would seem to be the minimum mandatory requirement of a clock. Right? However, I don't care. I actually think it's kind of amusing. Now, if it was a regular clock, I would be thoroughly pissed off. Right? If this thing just announced in a digital voice the time, and it told me it was 9 o'clock and it was 2 o'clock, I would be livid. But it's a Disney clock, for which I paid a lot of money. Right? And I twice paid a lot of money to get it repaired, because it isn't even a very good clock. And every time the time difference changes, it goes completely haywire. But Carla and our handyman together have figured out how to recalibrate it so it gets back to its prior level of dysfunction. Right? They have mastered this. The jewelry store refused to work on it. They said, it's beyond us. We can fix a real clock, but we can't fix this fucking thing. The hell is this? Right? But this goes on in every category. Right? People return to a bad restaurant at least once a year on their anniversary because it's where they had their first date. And they went there on their first date because nobody had any money. Now they got money, the food sucks, the service is bad, the neighborhood it's in is deteriorated, so you need an armed guard just to get to the place and get back, but every year on their anniversary they go. Why? Because it's what it means, it's not what it is. So the principle here is stop selling stuff. Every time you catch yourself selling based on the stuff, you got to stop and ask yourself, wait a minute. Who does this mean something to? How can we make it mean something to them? In the collector market, cars, uh, books, objects. Over 30% of the purchase purchases made, and the rare book people tell me, 70% of the price elasticity is when somebody is buying it because of it having personal meaning, not buying it as a collector in a category, and not buying it for investment purposes. Okay? So like the rare book company that I deal with, they, they have mastered lists. They're really good at it. So when they have a bunch of Ayn Rand stuff, they do a mailing to Ayn Rand Foundation supporters. Why? Because they'll pay twice as much as a regular rare book collector will pay for the same book because it has meaning. They will overpay. They will not ask, what will this be worth 10 years from now? They will not compare. They don't, they don't give a rat's ass about any of that, whereas the guy who's just a rare book collector and is looking for appreciation, he cares about all that data, if you will. So one of the first things I discovered in the hearing aid business when I did a bunch of work for Miracle Air, there's, there's a level of the business that happens medically, from MD to audiologist and so forth. And then there's this retail level that is kind of one step beneath it, Miracle Air, Beltone, et cetera. And then there's the cheap stuff like you can buy at Costco. Okay? And it is digital now, but it is still much, it works like your grandpa's did. You, know, you may have a remote in your pocket instead of taking it out to do it, but basically you're adjusting it yourself all the time, whether you're in a noisy environment or a quiet environment. It's better, but it works like your grandpa's stuff, and it's cheap. 
the stuff at the, the audiologist sells is really no better than Miracle Ear and Beltone, but people pay more for it because it's prescribed by a doctor. And so Miracle Ear and Beltone are in the, the upper middle of this <laughs> industry. They're real, they're sort of retail medicine, which is where the healthcare system is going anyway. And you don't have to be an audiologist to prescribe it in 49 states. You don't have to be an audiologist to sell it. Right? You don't even have to have an audiologist supervised to sell it. So you can own a Miracle Ear Center, and we can put a white coat on your brother-in-law, who is the butcher over at the grocery store, <laughs> and we can teach him the exam and the sales script, and we're good to go. Okay, this is the business. Okay? There's really no difference between the Beltone product and the Miracle Ear product, and there's basically no difference between those products and the products the audiologist is selling. In fact, there's two companies that make them all. So in that respect, it's a lot like skincare right, or cosmetics, lipstick. There's four companies in the United States that manufacture lipstick. That's it. There's only four. Go to a cosmetic counter and see how many different kinds of lipstick there are. They're all made at one of these four fac factories. It's all the same shit. Right? Uh, and, and many of it, it's even in the same container. It's just you got a black, this company got a black one with a little gold shit on it, and this one got a gold one with a little black stuff on it. It's the same lipstick. Okay? So hearing aids are the same. And everybody sells them based on that list. So the entire conversation is about the product, right? what it does. You can hear birds again. You can hear the TV without turning up the volume and annoying your, you know. You'll finally hear your spouse snore again, and they'll have to buy a Zipa. Um, you, you can hear horns honking, so you won't have a car wreck. So it's about the product. And what it does, it's functionality, right? Some argument of competitive comparative superiority. Made in the USA, not made in the USA, made with copper and palladium, made with some claim of comparative superiority. Price, discount, financing. A form of price for just 39 bucks a month you're good to go, right? And it's basically an $8,000 sale if you put it in both ears. Um, third of the people only need one right now, so you can sell a $4,000 sale if you want to. Um, a third of the people only need it, two-thirds of the people get sold one because the salespeople default down to the $4,000 as soon as they get a price objection. So I've just described the whole business to you as I found it. Now, if you really want to sell hearing aids, you figure out what it means to the woman or the guy. You don't worry about any of that stuff. If you really want to drive the sale, you figure out what does it mean. All right? Now, a product like that has a lot of negative meaning that is in the way and that you have to overcome. Right? And there's some gender difference to the negative meaning. Okay? Prim predominantly for women, it is the negative meaning is really about how they are perceived by others. So for women, buying a hearing aid is like dealing with premature hair loss and looking in the mirror every day and uh, the way you sell crepe erase at Guthy Record for the, okay, it's in that category. For guys, it's like erectile dysfunction and having the car keys taken away. It's the impending death looming outside the door. Uh, but the positive meanings are profound. And the positive meanings are, of course, avoidance of negative meanings. So the number one driver of hearing aid sales, if you can get somebody in the hearing aid business to do it, which I can tell you, after having been paid $2 million by them, is not easy to get them to do, is staying out of the nursing home. That's the meaning. Because if the adult children start to think you are addled, which you appear addled when you can't hear, 
And if you are addled, you appear even more addled than you are actually addled when you can't hear. They stick your ass in the nursing home. That's what they do. And so this is on the list of fears of old people. Number one, it's how reverse mortgages are sold. It's not right. Number one is nursing home. And staying out of the nursing home is the biggie. Okay? That's the psychological part of this sale. Now, you have to say it slightly more elegantly than I just said, but not much. It also fits for copywriters. It is the conversation already occurring in their mind. Okay? They are looking over their shoulder at their adult children every day. Um, they, they know they're already having the conversation of what are we going to do with mom and dad and how quick can we do it. Okay? Um, that's, and, and so they're like, if daughter calls and says, hey, I'm going to be in the neighborhood, I'm going to drop by, they're worried. Okay? They are not happy. They're nervous. Oh, shit, is she bringing two guys with nets? Because this is not, you know, this is not a good thing. Okay. So this conversation is already there. Okay. You can step in it relatively forcefully, just a tick better than I've done here. However, to try and get the industry to do it, really hard. And as soon as you like get them to do it once, you turn your back on them and they've gone right back to product, comparative superiority, right? And their answer to every objection when they are selling goes right back to this list. So it was common. We'd look at the transcripts and somebody would raise a psycho-emotional objection to the purchase. And they would, the sales guy translates it to an objection that fits this list. The most common, almost every one of them did it, is at some point, the woman did it twice as much as the guy, but the guys did it too. You're now to price, which is give or take 8,000 bucks. The customer would say, gee, I really wasn't planning. Gee, I wasn't really expecting. Gee, I wasn't really prepared to spend that much money on myself. I've given it to you verbatim. Right? Occurs in about 30% of the sales presentations when it comes to price of hearing aids. 99% of the time, 99% of the salespeople do not answer that objection. They answer a price objection, which it was not. And they answer it with product, features and benefits, comparative superiority, and some way to fix the price. So their answer to that question, they run through, they either do one of those or they do all of them right in order. Well, you know, it's worth $8,000 because it's made in the USA and it's made out of palladium and it's the same shit the astronauts used in their shoes. And it's super digital and it adjusts itself even in noisy environments. And it does that better than anybody else's digital technology because we got Swedish elves who figured all this out. And I know the price feels a little stiff to you, but you know, it's only $39 a month if you put it on your Sears credit card or MasterCard or Visa. That's the answer to that objection. 99% of the time. But it wasn't a price objection at all. The person didn't say anything about the price. He talked about how he felt about having to spend that price on him. That's what he said. He was explicit, for God's sakes. But because they are so stuck in this, they didn't hear what he said. They heard just enough of what he said to pigeonhole it. Oh, let's see. What does he say? Oh, he mentioned price. Whoop! This is a price objection. Right? That's, that's their level of sophistication. And they're on robot 
autopilot, you know, to do that. 50% of the time, they don't even let the person finish it before they start the price answer. You guys all understand what the customer was really saying, right? I got kids. I got grandkids. I'm going to die soon anyway. I'm stacking up all the money I can for them grandkids. I know my son is a moron. He's probably never going to be able to send them kids to college. And, and so I got to set aside enough money to get my granddaughter into school. The woman, if it's a woman, she, they could have a million dollars in the bank. Don't matter. Most of what she gets is Christmas gifts. She returns, and she takes that money, and she puts it in the coffee can that where she is saving up money for the grandkids to get when she drops dead. That's what she's doing. I don't care, rich or poor, okay? that's what she's doing. And that's what that objection was. So it's a psycho-emotional objection. It has to get a psycho-emotional answer. And I hope you got. And the meaning of, the positive meaning of being able to hear like you were 20 again has to be more important not just for you, but for them, which is who you are now concerned with, than is the drain of eight grand away from all the coffee cans that are underneath the mattress. That's what has to happen. Now, this is in every business with every customer. They are operating psycho-emotionally and we are operating over here, facts, figures, statistics, comparative benefits. And I don't care if you're B2B. Biggest B2B marketing mistake made on the planet is selling differently because it's B2B than it's B2C. But businesses don't buy anything. People in businesses buy things. Businesses don't buy a damn thing. Nothing. People in businesses buy stuff. And people mostly buy for psycho-emotional reasons. Okay? They don't buy for factual logic reasons. So the CEO of a Fortune 500 company behaves at work much like he behaves at home. The same way you would sell them a hearing aid is the way you've got to sell them a $50,000 consulting program or a $500,000 piece of equipment. You've got to deal with him, not the stuff. Okay? And everybody, so, like I've told the Infusionsoft people for years, I said, you are selling, if you're selling to a male business owner, what you need to get in your head is you are selling a solution to erectile dysfunction. You're not selling software. All right? You are selling a cure for impotence. Because the frustrated business owner who is trying to do any of this stuff we teach him to do is more often than not unable to do it. And the core feeling he gets from that is impotence. I know what I want to do. I know exactly what I want to do. And the damn, I can't get it to work. So how many of you in here with your own computers, just regular computers, how many of you get pissed off when it won't do what you want it to do? <laughs> Raise your hands. OK, good. Now, how many of you, let's do the men only. Raise your hands again if you get pissed off when it won't do what you want it to do. How many of you have a spouse or a kid who can make it do it for you? And how many of you are really pissed when you have to go get the spouse or the kid to do it? Of course. Why? Because what does that mean? See, what does that mean? All right? So different things mean the same thing means different things to different people. But it all has a meaning that has nothing to do with what it is. If you want a shorthand thing to try and remember, all the money is in the meaning. 
That's where all the money is. That's why we proved it. They choose not to do it because they got giant and their mud against the wall. But we can get a higher conversion rate selling proactive to a divorced mom or a divorced dad who has custody of the girl than a happy family. Same girl, same age, same acne. It's all about the guilt of the parent. All right? So solving that problem for that kid has a different meaning to dad who has got custody of a girl that he doesn't know what the hell to do with, and he feels bad anyway, and his ex-wife is constantly telling him what a shit parent he is, and the kid is locking herself in the room and crying. It has a different meaning to him than it does to a happily married couple raising that same kid in a reasonably functional home. Therefore, They'll buy easier, they'll buy faster, they'll pay more. The money is in the meaning, not in the glop. All right. So if you want a shorthand way to remember this, that's it. The money is in the meaning. In the sort of category of stop selling stuff, sort of there. But I wanted to answer it. So Dave Kloss, who's here somewhere, he's not hard to find. He's the weirdest looking guy in the room. Um, are you still wearing them shoes with the toes in them? But you're still wearing them. And why not today? OK. He's got shoes that have toes. So if you're like looking at a blue guy, like somebody from the blue band group, barefoot. That's what you're looking at. He's a weird dude. Um, so his question, which I didn't do last night, was, what is your judgment on we stand against X, marketing message, versus unique selling proposition? So the anti uh, position, the attack position, right? Um, and some expert I've never heard of is arguing that the we stand against is now significantly more powerful than the we stand for, right? Um, and um, uh, is this right or is this not right? So the first part of the answer is the guy that has discovered this and thinks for some reason that it's either new or that the circumstances of the moment make it more effective than it was in 1948. He's probably a millennial. Um, and he has no sense of history. Okay? It's almost always been the more powerful. Okay. Um, a lot of business owners, marketers, advertisers shun it, shy from it because um, they think it makes them look bad. They think that acknowledging the existence of the other gives it credibility. They more, they are in some kind of peer community that frowns on it. So they all play golf together in some way, shape, or form, like I talked about with the food bank. But there is no doubt that attacking a villain, which does not have to be a specific competitor, but attacking a villain is more attention getting more powerful and more persuasive to more people than merely extolling your virtues in a vacuum of extolling virtues. That does not negate the value of unique selling proposition, unique value proposition of what you're for. You do need to be for something, right? Um, so politically, you see the Democrats' problem at the moment is they're not for anything. They're just against. And at some point, people lose interest in, well, yeah, but what are you going to do? Well, I'm not going to do nothing. Right? I'm just going to scream and yell about this thing. But the screaming and yelling about this thing, that guy, this injustice, this villain, is in itself a very powerful thing. 
So I attack a lot uh, when I write copy, and when I, I almost always create at least one villain, right? And uh, one I did not too long ago that I really like. This is for a financial. How many of you know who Jim, Jim Cramer is? He's on CNNBC at night. You know, he's a guy who yells, and people ask him for stock tips, right? So this is for a financial advisor client of mine. It's a little picture of Jim Cramer. And it says, liar, liar, pants on fire, the harsh truth about picking stocks and TV experts like Jim Cramer. Now, understand, I'm going to give you a little bit of it, but understand what I've done. So to my point, one of my points, Jim Cramer is not a competitor to my financial advisor, but he is a competitor to financial advice and, and advisors as a whole. He is the quasi-do-it-yourselfer competitor. Yes. I don't need you, or I won't pay any attention to you. I'll get picks from the tout, and I'll do it myself. So it's not like I'm attacking the financial advisor across the street from her. I'm not attacking the other financial advisor who's running the free previews in the same town. But I have found a villain to attack that is competing for at least attention, if not even stopping patronage. Do you see the difference? Now, just for fun. Um, oh, and the other thing, I went and found somebody else to say it. So, which is a good thing to do all the time. So, his, do you watch Jim Cramer? His Mad Money Show attracts several thousand viewers nightly. By the way, that's all it attracts, just for the record. Um, um, we need like. Ten times this room. Um, so here is a reality report on the show from Frank Portnoy, the author of the books Infectious Greed and Fiasco, and a frequent commentator for NPR, National Public Radio. So I found somebody else to say all the bad stuff about him. So the financial advisor herself didn't have to say anything bad. She's merely reporting facts that somebody else has said. Okay? Um, I'll just cut to the chase. If you watch Mad Money and follow Jim Cramer's recommendations, you will lose almost 33% of your money in less than two months. That's the bottom line. Okay? When Cramer recommends a stock, on average it opens for trading the next day 2.4% higher, but viewers who bought the stocks Cramer recommended the previous night lost money relative to the market overall. And even people who held those stocks for as long as 50 days lost an average of nearly 10% relative to the market. The 50-day performance was even worse, a negative 29.54%. So I can attack based on, now these are, understand, very manipulated statistics. He is a moron, but that this doesn't really prove it because the losses are relative to other things. They are not losses just in the recommended stocks. But who the hell understands any of that? And I didn't have to have her say it. I had this guy to say it. Okay? So I'm all for attacking. It also bridges to principle 15, which is I don't think you really want to be very timid. Um, this is, and it doesn't mean you won't have problems, but so this is a photo from a small chain of restaurants called the Heart Attack Grill. <laughs> the big one is in Vegas. The others are having trouble. The franchising is having trouble because they actually had a guy drop dead. <laughs> and they didn't handle it real well. So, so I'll just give you the news. So the Heart Attack Grill, so first of all, if you've been in Vegas, you can go. It's a hospital-themed restaurant. Um, and it has become internationally famous for uh, embracing and promoting the unhealthy diet of incredibly large hamburgers. So customers are all referred to as patients. So there's a language. So like at Disney when they say welcome home and they use guest instead of customer, here when you walk in the door they talk about um, 
intake of a new patient. And you're a patient. Um, the orders are referred to as prescriptions and the waitresses as nurses. Um, all, everybody who weighs over 350 pounds is invited to unlimited free food, uh, provided they weigh themselves on the electronic cattle scale uh, for a cheering crowd. The menu includes the single bypass burger, the double bypass burger, the triple bypass burger, the quadruple bypass burger, the quintuple bypass burger, the sextuple bypass burger, the septuple and the octuple bypass burger. These dishes, uh, these sandwiches range in weight from half a pound to four pounds of beef. Um, uh, there are also flatliner fries cooked in pure lard and, and the coronary dog <coughs> and the butterfat Coca-Cola milkshake. Uh, Lucky Strikes, no filter cigarettes are available. And those, those old candy cigarettes that you can't find anyplace else anymore that we all had as kids are there alive and well for the kiddies. Um, patients who are unable to finish their meals are subjected to uh, public spankings by the, one of the nurses. Um, and, um, uh, and if you need to, they will wheel you out to your car afterwards in a wheelchair. Um, the restaurant was founded in 2005 by a non-AMA recognized physician. <laughs> um, in 2012, um, a person suffered an actual heart attack on the premises. Negative media coverage spiked because most people thought it was part of the show. <laughs> and they gathered around and took pictures. Um, and uh, it took a little while for somebody to call a real ambulance. And the guy dropped dead. And, um, you know, this place is not really popular with the media and the medical community to start with. So one of the franchises went out of business, the one that the guy dropped dead in. And the company is in some litigation. But the Vegas store is doing very well. Um, you may be able to see, here's the opening to it. And this sign says, heart attack grill. And this one says, 350 pounds each free. And it goes around, do, 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 you know, like the hard rock does. Um, and this is the, this is, these are the entrance doors, which look like, you know, ER doors. And they have a caution on them. Of course, there's disclaimers all over everywhere that it might not be a good idea to eat this stuff. Um, and what part of heart attack grill didn't you understand, you know? Um, um, but a pro prior to the guy dropping dead, um, and I think they'll come back, they were well on their way to 100 franchises like this. All right. And the publicity was just incredible. All negative, right, even before the death, all negative. But still, publicity. And people went, Hardy's plays this game a little. Carl's Jr. plays and Hardy's plays this game a little. Um, they have politically incorrect bad food and make a big deal out of it. And they play the sex thing. They are the ones that did the Paris Hilton commercial with the grease from the burger dripping all over. And they did somebody more recent than that. Um, the CEO of that company is the guy Trump tried to put in as Secretary of Labor. And it turned, well, and by the way, the guy's a great restaurant owner. He's a really smart guy. But it turns out he has some kind of illegal immigrant maid who worked for him in 2008 or something. And that was the end of that. But um, so I'm a big fan of anti-timidity. And I believe if you are going to be a little bit anti-timid at all, then you probably ought to go all the way in or not stick your toe in. So the best anti-timidity strategies on your page 60 that I know of are yes 
are, first of all, sell something. John raised it last night. Sell something you can believe in when you sell it. So you don't have a kind of internal reason to be timid. You actually think that it is great. In this case, I assure you, the owner thinks this is all good, clean fun. This is great entertainment. He does not really expect somebody to come there every day for lunch. It's one of these places that when a buddy comes to town, this is the thing you take him to. Right? The birthday, this is the thing we take Ron to for his birthday. Right? It's not the thing we go to every day. So find something to sell that you feel really good about selling. And if you, nobody raised their hand last night, and John was half kidding, but I mean really, if you're selling something that you're not all in on, there's a lot of stuff to sell. You do not need to stay in a business that you don't feel great about. Understand what really works and do it. Forget the standard should be what gets us the best result. That should be the standard. If we are ostracized by our peer community, you can make friends. You can get a dog. You can round up homeless people. They will applaud you. I mean, you don't need a peer community. Um, there's lots of people on the planet. If you make a lot of money, you can buy friends. They will hang around you. They will walk behind you and clap like for Tyson if that's what you want to do. Get your own ego out of the way. If you pick an anti-establishment audience, if that's what you pick, then you can't overdo the bashing of the establishment. Most of my money has actually been made going into environments where there is an establishment to poke hard and irritate and annoy and cause them to intensely dislike me. And there's a bunch of people waiting who were thinking the same thing but haven't voiced it. And they rise up and attach like there's no tomorrow. But again, you have to be willing to be the person as you walk through the room, a bunch of people turn their back on you and walk over to the other side. You have to be okay with, you have to be okay with that if you are going to uh, play this game. Um, we don't have easily accessible to us the orthodontics clip that all the orthodontics are, orthodontists are bugged about. The suicide clip. Would you look it up? So Dustin and I have done this program for orthodontists. And it's a bunch of videos for them to use. And um, it's to sell Invisalign, essentially. But what does Invisalign mean? Well, Invisalign means the same thing that proactive means. That's what it means. It means the same thing, right? It means the kid won't come out of her room and go to the prom or go on a date or whatever because of what she sees when she looks in the mirror. And this is going to ruin her life forever. What's the worst thing it can do? Have her kill herself. That's about as bad as it's going to get. Right? So the best meaning, so the money's all in the meaning. Often the money is all in the most acute meeting. Well, there's all kind of stats. Teen suicides through the roof. And it's because of social media bullying. So if your kid has crappy looking teeth, guess what? I can connect those dots. Kid with crappy looking teeth who's concerned about it, she won't come out of her room. What you don't know is on social media, they are lighting her on fire. It used to be six kids made fun of her in the hall. Now, 
they make fun of her to everybody in the whole school with a click. And you don't even know what's going on. And from there, I can connect the dot to a bunch of kids this is happening to are killing themselves. And you might want to walk down the hall and peek in to make sure she's still breathing. Understandably, this has made some of the orthodontists who use this program a little nervous. They feel a little skitsy about it. Not all of them, you right? No, but some, you know. And Dustin is having to deal with their, I don't have to, I did the work, I'm out of this picture. But, you know, Dust, Dustin is having to deal with their, right? And if you decide that you are going to play anti-timidity, you will have to deal with your own, about what it is that you find to do, all right? Just really like the stick them in a nursing home thing. A whole lot of people in that business went, ew, I don't really want to talk about that. Well, but that's the thing we can talk about that has the most impact. So why do we care what you want to talk about and don't want to talk about, right? So did you find it? Okay, so here's one of the clips that people go, eh, about. Oops. We have film, we have no sound. This is why I don't do this. That's why. Uh, this is why I don't do this. I hate technology. Um, um, now yeah, you'll hear it or you won't. We'll give up in a minute. Uh, or we'll hit it when we come back from lunch. Coalition. Um, dot now we got it. Now we Today, got it. the smile or lack of it creates both audio and visual cues. And other people respond accordingly, automatically. Not smiling, hiding your smile, doesn't just turn people off. It warns them off. If your daughter or son is deprived of the innate natural use of smile as cues to others, they are handicapped and at disadvantage, just as they might be by any other handicap. Here is some data gathered from the nonprofit oh, confidencecoalition.org, founded by the Kappa Delta sorority from the news organizations and from the American Medical Association. 90% of all girls want to change at least one part of their physical appearance. A girl is bullied every seven seconds at school. One out of every four college age women have an eating disorder. Only 2% of women think of themselves as attractive. Isn't this remarkable? Well, it isn't just girls. From other research, we found that 70% of boys say some aspect of their personal appearance is constantly made fun of or criticized by others. I know you do not want to be the mom or dad of the embarrassed teen hiding in his or her bedroom, maybe skipping the prom or some other event and insisting they just don't want to go, avoiding social activities but never telling you why. Going to high school with crooked teeth and a poor smile is one thing. Going on to college admission and job interviews is another. Looking in the mirror at a bad smile on the day of prom is bad, but seeing that smile in the mirror on the day she is delivering her big first presentation to her company's board or at a conference is another. Again, she says, I'll just stay at home. But what is she really saying? There's another clip with the Suicide has jumped oh, by 24% in America in the last decade. One of the two top categories of that growth is preteen, teen, and college age young people. A driving force is the explosive expansion of shaming done on social media. It isn't just a few mean girls pointing and giggling in the hallway anymore. It's mean girls messaging to everyone in the school. Naturally, you think a thing like teen suicide happens only in other people's families, but that's exactly what those parents thought. Now you can stop. So, what, so you even went, ooh, with the handicap thing, for God's sake. I mean, wow. I mean, yeah, so 
so what picture I want there is a lot of people go, well, they aren't that bad. You know, it's not that big a deal. They'll grow out of it. Uh, my teeth weren't perfect as a kid either. So I've equated it now to the person with no leg, um, you know, and, and one arm dragging themselves like Quasimodo through the halls. <laughs> um, you know, uh, then, then I've used my same proactive copy about she won't come out of the room, she won't go to the prom, it's the same stuff we use for proactive. And then I wound up with, eh, she might even kill herself. And, <laughs> and it'll be your fault, right? Now, I happen to think I was relatively subtle. Uh, but, um, but I get that subtlety is in the eye and ear of the beholder. Uh, but if you are going to go, this is the way to go. You do not be subtle. If you are going to sell on anti-timidity, you go all in on anti-timidity. And what is about eight grand, right? An Invisalign case? Yeah. So this, this $8,000 number is a lot less to solve this than it is to solve this. Eight grand just to solve this. Eh. Eight grand to solve that. Cheap, right? And they're looking at each other thinking, no, I wouldn't think it would happen in our family, but, you know, I certainly don't want to be the one to be having this conversation with my spouse when we find her hanging from her neck in her bedroom closet. Okay? This is the thinking I want to create when I do something like that. It is particularly useful, by the way, when you have weak salespeople at the end of this process, which most orthodontists, right? So Dustin and, and, the, guy, and the folks in his office don't need any of they're just fine without it. But the majority of the orthodontists, the thing they're the worst at is the sales presentation, the money, and the clothes. So if I can create a much higher level of angst before I put them in front of the mediocre salesperson, the mediocre salesperson can get better results. That's the gig.